So you've come to the conclusion that early Genesis is not literal history and is in the genre of ancient mythology, or at least you're entertaining that idea. Well, okay. So what then does it mean? Well, we're in a series here where we are taking the first chapter bit by bit. In this video, we're looking at Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We'll break this up into two pieces. First, formless and void. Second, the deep. What does it mean that the earth was formless and void? Well, let's hop back to verse 1 for a second, which the most modern scholarship asserts is actually best translated as when God began to create the heavens and the earth. So combining verse 1 and the first part of verse 2, we get when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void. So in this story, God is beginning his acts of creation with some material already there. We learn elsewhere in the Bible that God made everything out of nothing. But in this inspired story, which I think is also polemic art, God is using pre-existing materials. One thing this does is set up the view held by some scholars that Genesis 1 is concerned with functional creation, not material creation. The view here, popularized by John Walton, but espoused by others as well, is that this account presents God giving function to things rather than creating them materially. As Walton writes, the creation account in Genesis 1 can then be seen to begin with no functions rather than with no material. Similarly, as Soden and Miller articulate, the Hebrew actually describes something that is desolate or unproductive. And again, as Turner and Davidson point out, referring to the word formless, that denotes lacking purpose, order, or meaning. What does the word void mean? Well, the Hebrew is often translated as empty, and Turner and Davidson explain that it does not simply mean the absence of material items. It includes the sense of things missing that would normally be expected to be present. Okay, so that is one angle. Now there's another angle here as well. Formless and void, or formless and empty, sets up the framework hypothesis. Under this hypothesis, in days one through three, God solves the formless problem by creating realms. Then in days four to six, he solves the void or empty problem by filling those realms. This then becomes an explanation for the six creation days as a poetic device. And many see this device being set up here in verse two. Okay, so now what about the rest of the verse? It reads, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. But let's focus on the deep. The deep, or the primeval waters, is a symbol and a source of chaos and disorder in the ancient Near East. Indeed, in the broader culture of that time and place, a chaotic mass of water with no apparent beginning already existed before the creation of the gods or the universe. And so this is the appropriate place for Genesis to start because it was a common place for other ancient Near East creation accounts to begin. For example, as Ben Stanhope explains, this initial state of watery chaos out of which the world emerged was a staple in Egyptian art depictions and mythology. And all four major versions of our Egyptian cosmological texts have creation emerging from a primeval watery abyss, usually deified as the god Nun. Over on the other side of Israel, S. H. Hook explains that in a tablet which contains a list of the Sumerian gods, the goddess Namu, whose name is written with the, uh, with the ideogram for C, is described as the mother who gave birth to heaven and earth. But the Hebrew writer had his own theological messages. In Genesis, God tames the deep. His spirit hovers over it. Now, the context of the Hebrew word for hover is one of quiet or gentle observation. God did not have to arm for battle against the raging demon of chaos. All was already under his control. Instead, the hovering may be viewed as the contemplative brooding of a mother bird who looks about for the best place for the nest. In the ancient Near East, conflict was involved in the creation of the earth out of primeval waters. In Genesis, there is no conflict. God has it all under control. He has quieted the seas akin to when Jesus calmed the sea. Indeed, in the Enuma Elish, Marduk battles Tiamat, the god of the deep, and cuts her in two to create the heavens and the earth. The word deep in Genesis shares the same root as does Tiamat. If, as Peter N. suggests, the planned words was intentional, slain Tiamat is dimly reflected in God's taming the deep, that even further emphasizes the intentional differences between the ancient Near East accounts and Genesis. 
Surely, as Ben Stanhope emphasizes, there is no hint at all in the Genesis creation account that God participates in any sort of struggle with this watery Tihom. Another key difference is that in the ancient Near East, the deep is associated with gods. As Clark Morlis writes, ancient pagan understandings of God viewed the deep waters as either some type of God or some other rival to the authority of the gods. This is not so with Genesis. Genesis teaches us that the deep waters stand subject to the work of God as the unrivaled and ruling creator. In Genesis, as opposed to rival accounts, the primeval waters are just another creation of God. God reigns over the deep. Now, what about the spirit that was hovering over the face of the waters or of the deep? Is that a reference to the Holy Spirit? Is the third member of the Trinity introduced in the second verse of the Bible? I tend to think the answer is yes. Uh, but this is controversial. Not all will agree. And the verse could be translated to say, a mighty wind was blowing over the waters. What do you think? 